So in your zeal, use that zeal to find out who else is interested. That's the first step in any fundraising. You find out who God has called to your ministry. What is their heart? Don't try and force it. You're not fundraising for yourself. It's bigger than you. You're fundraising for the ministry that you're going to do. And you have to understand that any donor to your fund is more important than the money they give. Okay, that's another really hard lesson. Welcome to the Lausanne Movement Podcast, where we have a passion to accelerate global mission together. If you like today's episode, won't you take a moment to rate and review our podcast and subscribe? That way you won't miss a thing. And now for today's interview. Barbara, welcome to the podcast. Well, thank you for having me. This is a great opportunity and a true honor. Yeah, I mean, it's a real pleasure to have you with us today. Your journey and contributions to the world of fundraising especially within Christian ministries, is truly inspiring. To kick us off, can you share with us your journey that led you into the world of fundraising and into founding your organization, Give Away Vision, Vin, Visioneering? Give Way, Give Way. Give Way Visioneering. Give way visioneering. There you go, mm-hmm. Give Way Visioneering. Were there any specific moments or experiences that defined your ministry? Yes, there sure are. It starts out, though, doesn't it, with a family that is generous I'm a first-generation refugee family. My parents were refugees from Ukraine, and they arrived in Canada in 1926. And so it's quite a journey to know that they depended on people's generosity. And that's actually the the flip side of fundraising, is finding people who are generous and finding those who the Lord has actually assigned for your specific ministry. Before I get into that, though, yes, we I grew up quite poor from Canadian standards and learned to be very careful with money and to really understand that there were people less fortunate than us all the time. My mother used to complain that my dad would give his shirt off his back for anybody and to think that that's from a mentality of just gratefulness from being in the position that they were. So that's a big setting. And I think that's something we can each do for our families and for those around us. But what it also meant to me is that I understood what it was like for people to be in a mindset where they're desperate. And that's really been a changing point for me in my years of ministry in talking about money and fundraising. It's not like I'm coming from a place where I've always had everything I needed. You know, I had to make my own clothes. I had to do all of the stuff that people do when you don't have what you basically need. So that was an interesting upbringing. And then the real thing that happened, though, my husband and I became missionaries with Transworld Radio. Now, the thing is, I think everyone will understand this who's in ministry, is that when you hear the call of God on your life, you are full of zeal. There is no way someone is going to change your mind. No human being could walk into your life and go, oh, if you give me, you know, something. In fact, my husband was working in IT before it was called that. And his supervisor got in quite a bit of trouble because he didn't offer him more money to stay with the company instead of going into missions. And his supervisor said, I'll argue with any human, but not with God, he said. And he wasn't a believer. He said, there's no way he's going to change his mind. I can see that quite evidently. And that's the thing that you have to remember, I think, in ministry, is that God has called you. And there's always this pat answer, oh, well, what God calls, he will fund. But there's a lot more to it than that. Anyway, we were on the field for 12 years. And then we needed to go back to Canada just for family reasons. And I ended up working in an art gallery, a city art gallery. Now, we had raised our own support to go out as missionaries in the beginning. So I was familiar with raising support for your your work. But when I worked in an art gallery, which is also a nonprofit, I found out that, you know, all about corporate fundraising, how businesses, how business people like to give. I learned about grant writing, about volunteers, because volunteers are a huge benefit to an organization. So, you know, I was just getting a job, but the Lord was preparing me for the future. 
And our kids by that time were teenagers. And then what also happened at the art gallery is that I always thought I was like artistic in thinking, you know, and that, you know, I wanted to do something artistic. But while I wasn't working in an art gallery, I realized that actually I had a business brain and I had no idea. I mean, really, I had no idea. So, and neither did anyone else. And in fact, my husband was quite annoyed when I actually got a business, an international business degree. And he said, and I'm the one who taught all our kids math and you're <laughs> doing all of this. So that changed my life quite a bit. First of all, being in missions, understanding it. Secondly, understanding that business people are very involved. And I'd really like to get back to that because that's something I think we overlook a lot. And then also just that business and money are not considered negative to God. We spend all our days making money, most of our waking hours making money, spending money, and wondering how we're going to make ends meet. Yet we think money is somehow separate from God. Faith and money have been separated over the years. It's always great for me to hear the journey that the guests on this podcast have gone through because you can often see the connections throughout their story that have enabled them to go into the ministry, whether it's a specific ministry or whether it's a function that has enabled them to do really well in that space. And you can clearly see that in your story as you've been going through. You can clearly see how each part of your journey has enabled you to become a great fundraiser and strategist around that. Now, let's dive into that whole question of faith and finances and the connection between the two. Because, you know, I, as I think about the missionaries that I've connected with over the years here in South Africa, as I think about some faith heroes that I have, as I've read about their stories about fundraising, there is the, often a disconnect. People struggle to say, you know, I, I'm not going to fund my ministry. I'm not going to I'm not going to connect with others and, and try and find sponsorship or activate the generosity of other people because God has to do that. And so I'd really be interested to unpack that concept with you. Could you just share some of your thoughts around that? Sure. And, and it surely is up to God, that's for sure. But it's more fun to do it together, don't you think? I would like to read Revelation 7, 9 to 12, because I think if Jesus would have said, here's a vision statement for, your, for our teamwork together, this might have been it. It's what it is to me anyway. After this, I looked and behold, a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands and crying out with a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the lamb. And all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures. And they fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped God, saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. And that is what I think is one of the things at the base of fundraising. If we do this just with God, who's the hero? Okay, it could be God. Most likely it's going to be us. But if we have to include others, it's part of the ministry. And I think that's what fundraising is. We have a team around us. My husband and I think if we didn't have people praying for us, what would we do? And the thing is, where your treasure is, there's where your heart is as well. So when people are supporting you monthly, they are thinking and praying about you. What you're really asking maybe is, do you have to fundraise or should you just ask, for example, a lot of people use George Mueller as an example. Now, if you actually go into George Mueller's story, he extorted money as a teenager from his father's work as a tax collector, and he was addicted to gambling. He needed money all the time. So, of course, if George Mueller had fundraised, you know, that would be Really, he didn't want to have that in front of him. And he was so particular about that. He didn't allow renting of pews, which is how churches used to actually fund churches in their day. And he also wouldn't take a salary. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't think I would be able to work without some kind of framework of a salary. He did not take a salary. 
very admirable. So if someone is willing to do all of that, I say, you know, God bless you, because that's really a step of faith. And that's wonderful. But then he also used to do something that I would call fundraising, which is he had a huge platform because of all the miracles he'd seen. I'm not negating anything of that he did because it, it truly is fascinating. Yeah, yeah. And so he would, he had a huge platform in churches. He could go out and talk about the ministry without saying anything, just reporting what was done. Now, that's a really good point to remember for people who are fundraising. Because not everyone has that platform, okay? If you had somewhere, if you were like booked up and, you know, every night you could talk about your ministry and just say what God has done in it, you'd probably be able to raise funds a lot quicker. So that's something else to consider. But the other thing is, when I've talked to some people, now I'm not painting everyone with the same brush at all, but some people who don't ask for funding do it as a kind of badge of honor and judge others who don't do that. And that's where you kind of go, okay, this is about you. It's not really about God. So that's something that I really, you know, I don't watch for it. I just think kind of goes with the territory because we're human. It's not because, you know, they're terrible people. I mean, we all have pride issues. So I'm not saying that, but I am saying as soon as you can, when you're asked to fund anything in your ministry, remember it's not about you, okay? That helps you give a step of separation. It means that you don't think, oh, I'm asking for my salary. Well, you might be, but, or I'm asking for, in the case of L4 delegates or delegates to any of the Lausanne conferences, well, I have to ask for me. Well, no, no, no. You're asking for what God is going to do through you in the future. You know, just go past yourself and just think, what is God going to do with me after this conference? Why am I going? Am I just going to travel? I mean, it's always an honor to get invited to a Lausanne conference because you are only asked if there's something that you have to offer. That's the whole point of a Lausanne conference is in order to share ideas. And as far as my ministry goes, you know, after I w worked at the art gallery, after our family issue was sorted, then we went back into ministry, or my husband stayed there the whole time, but I went back into ministry and back into Transworld Radio. But then I had a business degree going, but then I had something different to offer Transworld Radio, and I became responsible for the church ministries in the U.S. because the head office is in the U.S., and so I learned a lot there. And I also learned that in the U.S., every state is different. The people in each state are very proud of their state. So when you're in New Hampshire and you see people wearing plaid because it's kind of a rural state, you're not going to wear that plaid when you go to California <laughs> because they would laugh at you. <laughs> so that kind of opened my eyes to a lot of things, which was very helpful because when I was asked to go to talk to Eastern Europeans about how to fundraise. Now, this was in 2003. Communists fell in Eastern Europe in 1989. So having understood a bit about the U.S. and how different each state was, because it's not really like that in Canada, so I really didn't get that until I worked there for quite a few years. But then in 2003, Transworld Radio asked if I would go and teach fundraising to the Eastern Europeans who had been under communism and really didn't have any opportunity to understand how they would go about speaking in churches or speaking to individuals about fundraising for their ministries. But Transworld Radio was quite clear with the rising middle class in Eastern Europe, they were not going to fund Eastern Europe for the rest of their ministry lives. So the job was to go in and say, okay, we can see that the North American church is decreasing in size. Our support might, might not decrease in size. As it turns out, we just have less donors, but they give more. But, you know, we can't fund your ministry forever. It's not sustainable. And the definition of sustainable I like to use is, can we do this forever? To expect a foreign entity to fund a ministry 
for that whole ministry's life is completely unreasonable. <laughs> when you think about it, we would never do that with our children, with people around us, but somehow we think that's okay in ministry. You know, we're going to ask you for funding and you're going to fund us forever. It just isn't realistic. So going to Eastern Europe and having that message, you know, it wasn't well accepted and there was always, you know, arguments about it. We can't do that here. We've never done that before. We're too small. The church is too small. People are too poor. And the Lord led me to Philippians. In Philippians, we see that Paul had planted a church and then left. There were usually ministers he left behind. In that case, it was Timothy for a while, but not not for good. Meanwhile, the church in Jerusalem was suffering. Believers were being persecuted. They needed funding. And Paul said, you know what? The Gentiles can do that. And they're kind of, well, you know, we'll believe it when we see it, right? So Paul was not only had planted that church in Philippi, the church in Philippi was obviously funding themselves, funding Paul as a missionary. Now that's where you can probably fund someone if they are going place to place and they are ministering that way. That would make sense to fund that person. And they were generously giving to the church in Jerusalem. Paul was collecting for that. Now, Paul definitely asked. When you look in the New Testament, he didn't pull any punches. The church in Philippi, they figure, was about 15 years old. They were persecuted. They were small. And they were poor. And so to say that those are things that will stop you from asking for funding locally is really not biblical. I mean, I'm sorry, I've really done a lot of research on this. I have not seen any biblical model that shows a foreign entity looking after a local church or a local ministry for good. It just doesn't exist in the Bible. Now, when you think about the early church, they were believers working out of a position of great stress. After Constantine, it is after Constantine where missionaries started going out, and they were from a perspective of great admiration. And they went out. That's the first thing that I've seen as far as my research has gone. They were the first ones to go out in the third century to the pagans. So we've been doing this for a long time, <laughs> but now we're seeing as the global south increases the middle class and is quite capable of handling the gospel. I mean, who are we to say, oh, we're going to come in? But you know what it is? It's because we have the money. Foreigners with money end up being the people who determine the direction of ministries. And it's very dangerous because what happens is, and, and in my experience, speaking to probably leaders from probably 100 countries or something, but what happens is, in ministries is that the foreigner actually assumes that they are superior. They assume that because they're wealthy. And then on the other side, the local people assume that they aren't as smart because they don't have wealth, so they need to listen to these foreigners. Well, when I was working in Vienna then with Eastern Europeans, I had an assistant who was from an African nation, and we went to see a video in that was, you know, I mean, in, in 2003, nobody was talking about this really very much. And there was one person who I knew of who had done a video series on this topic, and they were showing his video in England. And so we went to visit, see this video, do some other work. In this video, it said this concept of it was specifically for Africa and talking about the country where my assistant was from. And I said they actually think that the North Americans funding them are smarter than them and more spiritual than them. And I thought, that's just crazy. So I turned to her and I said, you don't really think that. I mean, you know I'm not smarter than you because she was she is way smarter than me. And you know I'm not more spiritual than you. And these huge tears started coming down. And she said, 
that is what we think. So we listen to what you say, even if God has told someone that they should do a particular ministry, when a foreigner comes along with money and says, oh, I think you should just adjust that a bit, or this is what I'd like you to do, they change. It's unbelievable. And then they can't get back to that place where God assigned them a task because after a while they've got staff, they've got things to worry about. And this is where in many countries, when there isn't a rule of law or an understanding of governance, that corruption enters. And we see that way too much. One of the business admissions leaders told me that he has anecdotally looked at ministries and he feels that about 50% of nonprofits, that's not just Christian, but nonprofits, are scams. So if you think, you know, I mean, there are terrible stories. <laughs> and some of them are told in the book by Brian Fickert that's called When Helping Hurts. Very important book. Unfortunately, when people read that book, they stopped giving because they were afraid that where they were giving was one of these places that was just a scam. You can't prove it. And that is how Giveaway Visioneering was born. <laughs> so the company that I now, the business that I now do, is split into two sides. So, you know, I like to say there are three sides to a coin. There's the person who gives, there's the person who receives, and then there's that edge in the middle that is actually a ridge. And, and every coin is different, and every country is different, every culture is different. There has to be an understanding of people who give that they need to be cognizant of the fact of their position of power. And what I found is that it was actually easier to talk to people in developing nations about having local funding and doing their own fundraising than it was when I moved back to North America and tried to tell people that they need to stop having this savior mentality that they're going over and they're going to change the world. Yes, you do want to change the world. Yes, you have been given money to do that. But you need to really understand you only have to think about maybe three or four ministries or charities. You don't have to save the whole world. So one half of my business is talking to givers and saying, okay, what is it that you want to change in the world? Name two or three things you want to change in the world, and then let's focus on that. So that's the consulting with giving. On the other side, I consult with those who are trying to raise funds. And I have to admit, I specialize in areas where they say, oh, we can't fundraise. And have actually done that over the last few years. It's, it does take about three years, three to five years to just even change someone's mind, I found. But it's the business community that has gotten involved in this particular church in Canada and there is a saying that we have, and that is that the resources are in the harvest. So that is what I was consulting with this church saying, you know, you're very small, but the resources are in the harvest. If you fundraise, thinking about the end goal, really what you want is more people in your church to give offerings. That's actually what you want. So how are you going to grow the church? You can actually do that through fundraising. And that's something that people don't think about. And now after three years of having events and, and doing more in their own church for the homeless, for those who are newcomers to Canada, other services to the community, they have been recognized by the community as, wow, you're here for us. You're serving us. And then we were able to go out to the business community and say, would you also give to this? And the business community, non-Christians, are giving to some of the homeless efforts and things like that, very excited about what the church is doing in the community, giving to that, and in that, becoming involved in the church. And we see the Holy Spirit grabbing them. And just like there's no way, as you know, there's no way we could convince people from the business community to come into the church and, I want to help you do this. And it's like, okay, you know there's stained glass 
And these stories tell the story of Jesus coming to earth for us in the same manner that we are going to the community. And I am just amazed at how the Lord is changing those people. One of the ministers in the area said, this is pre-evangelism. It is including people who are volunteering to serve the community, which is also what we are doing as a church. And every person, every believer should be serving others with their money, no matter how much they have, like my dad, or serving the community as volunteers, or really just cognizant of the spiritual need of the person you see every day. But too often in our societies, we have really whitewashed that, I think, you know, oh, well, you know, I pass that person every day, but I don't need to speak to them. Well, just go out of your comfort zone one morning. If the Lord gives you, obviously with the Holy Spirit talking to you, I mean, yeah, we're it's not up to us, but just say, Lord, who can I speak to today about you? Who can I help? Who can I give something, my services, just something to? It doesn't mean that you give what you don't have. It doesn't mean if you don't have anything to offer that person that you actually try to do something out of your own strength. That's not it. But you'll be surprised how quickly the Lord answers that prayer because that is Jesus' heart. That's the heart we're trying to reflect into the community. Not that we know it all. Not that we have this wonderful perfect life that we are so religious or we're so perfect that you know we we know better than you no we are humble we need to be humble like Christ was and say whatever Christ the lord has given us as just our personalities we need to reach those with that personality around us that's our assignment it's a given <laughs> and also if they need help in some way it's a given. That's our assignment. We don't have to question, oh, should I do this? No, the Lord makes us certain personalities. We attract personalities like us. That's our mission field. That Everybody has that. But if you are particularly called to raise funds, let's take an example of those raising funds to go to a conference. You know, 2003, I was pretty well on my own studying about the sustainability of local ministries. And there were very few books about it. Now there's tons. I mean, you can get lots of books about it. What I did find is that once I got into the Lausanne world, and once I went to a conference, I suddenly had this network of people who were thinking like me. What do you know? I'm special. I've got this message. Guess what? Everybody else is too. <laughs> so that's where I found some common research, because at that stage it was research. Sometimes Lausanne is, people say about Lausanne, oh, well, it's just a bunch of people talking about research and it's, there's no, no product. Let me tell you, once I got in 2011, I had that network that I could bounce ideas off. We, iron sharpens iron. We came up with all kinds of things. One of the favorite things for me is going to another country that, you know, supposedly missionaries are going to. And talking about fundraising, and then they say, oh, that reminds me of this. A totally different thing than I've heard from anyone else up to that point. Because God is quite capable of ensuring that people understand his word and the connection to their culture. And so other cultures, are just, it just fascinates me because I love it. But it's also part of the Lausanne world. So you're going to be challenged by other people who are going to say, oh, well, and I've had this said to me hundreds of times, you're from Canada. You can't possibly understand what it's like in our country. Guess what? I can't. But you can. And God has told us to do this and you can do it. And so I've always been this kind of grandma coming in and people thinking, oh, well, you know, what's she going to tell us about fundraising? But I'll have you know, <laughs> Uh, a Bachelor of Science in Business Administration, International Focus, and a Master's of Global Development Management. And I have a lot of experience after being in 55 countries, personally, and talking to people from many places and many countries, but that I, even still, I know I don't know what they're going through. 
even the difference between a city person and a rural person. Their churches are going to be completely different personalities. So you can't say, oh, this is going to work for everyone. But what we came up with, and actually it was with the Eastern Europeans in the beginning, we came up with a few universal concepts. And those are completely biblically based. I do have video series that we made internally in Transworld Radio, which you can look up. Those basic universal biblical concepts don't change. You know, we are all to give the church in Philippi and in all through the Bible. They looked after themselves. They did not ask foreigners first. And that's the other thing I need to kind of qualify there. There's nothing wrong with getting money from foreigners for your ministry. But the caution I would put in there is that it should be just for capital projects. So your day-to-day ministry should be able to be met by the local believers because they're all in the same economic, political, and cultural setting. If you really feel you need a capital project that your local community can't fund, which even still I think you should try first, and the Lord presents you with someone who will help you with that, that's fine but don't let it take over your ministry and the calling God has given you. You know, there are local business people everywhere. I always ask people, well, don't you know any sales salespeople? You know, there's salesmen, saleswomen who know how to ask people for money. They know how to do an ask and make a sale. So in our churches, we don't tap into them. We think because of this faith and money thing, we don't think, oh, that car salesperson, he sells used cars, you know, we don't think about, oh, he has a network that we would only dream about. Why don't you ask him to get involved in fundraising for what you need? Let the Lord speak to him and get him excited about what the Lord wants to do through you. And you've got a network right there. The same thing with real estate people. If you know anybody in real estate, They really know, they have taken the psychology courses, they know people, they will be able to help you. But we don't tend to really ask the business community for help. You know, it's just really sad. I find that the business community becomes a checkbook for the local church and that often the leaders of a local church only pay attention to them at times when they need money. And really, they've got a lot more to offer. They have access to volunteers, like I said, in a network that we we would just dream of. But we ignore them. Why? Because they make money. And the, it seems the more wealthy people are, the more we stand off and don't say, oh, you know. Whereas in reality, those people, Transold Radio had a station in Monte Carlo. That was actually our first field. <laughs> so it went from rural Canada mm to Monte Carlo. And it was pretty wild. But what I learned there is that everyone has a void that the Lord can fill. And even the wealthiest people wonder in the quiet moments about their mortality. They try to cover it up, as we all do. We, none of us like to talk about mortality. You know, we, we all save stuff up thinking, you know, we're going to need it someday or something like that. But really, if we had more of Jesus in us, thinking through, when I purchase this, am I helping someone? That's a purpose in purchasing something. Do I really need it? Sometimes if you're helping someone, you don't care if you need it. Do I need to have all of this stuff? Or should I be stewarding my money for the Lord's work in a better way? So there's so many threads here. There's just a lot about it. And I think that when we look at the Good Samaritan, what we call the Good Samaritan, you know, that was a business person probably who really helped that person, not the clergy. It was business people who sponsored Tyndall's ministry to put the English Bible into a vernacular that local people could understand, totally funded by business people. Do you hear about them? No, they were also one of them was also hung. Very interesting. I mean, this is like, these are things we don't think about, but business people are willing 
And I have no problem talking about money to business people. I have problems talking about money to ministry people. (laughs) (laughs) Whereas really, as we know, there are more verses in the Bible about money and possessions and warnings than any other topic. So it is important to God. He wants us to steward what we have to his honor and glory. We're not going to be perfect about it. Of course, we, we're human. We, we're dust and we will return to dust. But when we remember that, maybe we don't buy so much junk. <laughs> So, Barbara, you've unpacked a lot for us over the course of the past few minutes. I would like to distill that and take a moment just to get really, really practical. I think you've set the stage. I think you've sold the vision to me and I'm ready to buy in. I'm ready to dig into this whole thing of activating business people, workplace people for God's kingdom. What advice? So let's jump into fundraising 101. You are speaking to mostly mission leaders there are workplace leaders who listen to this podcast, but for someone who's feeling called to start or to improve their fundraising efforts, what first steps would you recommend they take? So I'm saying get really, really practical here. And how can they ensure that the efforts are aligned with God's mission? And what advice would you give them as they think about the business people in their sphere of influence? What advice would you give them to engage those people for God's mission? So let's kind of go back to George Mueller. He talked to everyone about his ministry. And that's how I felt at the beginning of our calling as as missionaries. We were going to go out and change the world. It's zeal. It is the zeal of God. And you know if you've got it. If you're a business person, you know when you see it. Because entrepreneurs are the same way. They can't stop talking about their new business. And the same thing with missions. You can't stop talking about what God is calling you to do. But I would like to just talk for a second about John Nevius. I've got this book that is called The Planting and Development of Missionary Churches. Now, Nevius is famous for, along with the rest of the Clapham sect, which would be Wilberforce, Henry Venn, who was one of the first ones to talk about the three-self theology, or the it goes into four-self theology, but three-self church. It was born out of a concern of sustaining local ministry so that they would be strong from the start. In a foreword written by Bruce Hunt after the Second World War, he said, in our missions, zeal has gone ahead of knowledge. And we already have the knowledge. First of all, Nevius went to China, and then China closed its doors to missionaries, and he went to Korea, Japan, and there were other places in Asia. But he adhered to the three self-principles, self-propagating, self-supporting, and self-governing. And if we would actually use that model and govern our churches and what we fund self-governing. That means the people, the local people are looking after themselves and they're doing it in a way that is accountable, that Jesus would be standing beside their accounting books and saying, good job, good on you. But guess what? That's not what happens in ministries because of things that I said before, where they're not always able to follow what the foreign money thinks they should be doing. Self-propagating. So the missionary doesn't do the work. They advise. They started, of course, advise. But it's that transfer where things become muddled. So what you want to do at the beginning of your fundraising is understand that zeal is not the same thing as knowledge. Become knowledgeable about what you need to do. I've seen a lot of missionaries and a lot of people even come into urban ministries in Canada, walk in, say, God's called me, and not listening to the local people. Not listening. What has already been done, don't waste money. That's, you know, I I am starting the practical issues of fundraising because it's don't waste the money you're given to start a ministry. Look at what's already going on. Join in with what God is doing and support it. 
but in a way that is sustainable. So it could go on forever. You are not going to be there forever. Missionaries are supposed to work themselves out of a job. So it's important to understand that when you are fundraising, make sure that you're fundraising for something that other people can also grasp. Find those givers who want to change the world the way you are doing it. And you'll find them because you ask the Lord to please help you find people who he has also called to minister in this way or to fund this initiative or this business that you're going to do in another country in order to reach the people there. So in your zeal, use that zeal to find out who else is interested. That's the first step in any fundraising. You educate people, you find out who God has called to your ministry, and then you talk to them. You also listen to them. What is their heart? What do they want to do? If it's not aligning with what you're wanting to do, don't try and force it. You know, don't say, oh, well, you know, you, you should give to me instead. Let them find the people that they are called to fund. And that's another thing. Respect for the donor is often ignored. It's like, well, I've got to find these people to fund this. Believe me, I've been there. <laughs> you do have to. But there's always a reason why you're being delayed. And it's usually to bring on more prayer support so that when you actually go out and do whatever you're doing, even if it's just going to a conference, you're going to have those people praying for you. You're going to run into those who are going to expand your network and expand your work because what you want to get out of that conference is you want to leave there with action plans on what you're going to do the day you get home. And that is why you're fundraising. You're not fundraising for yourself. It's bigger than you. You're fundraising for the ministry that you're going to do. So first of all, you have to have that in your head. And you have to understand that any donor, any giver to your fund is more important than the money they give. Okay, and that's another really hard lesson. Very hard lesson. Because we get so focused on the money that we need. And we do need it. I'm not negating that at all. We do need it, but we can often get so focused on that, that we, and I've done this too, as a, even as a fundraiser, I just cringe when I think of some of the people who I've said, well, yeah, but you could still give even with that. And it's like completely ignoring what they have just said to me, ignoring their needs and what happens in the long run with those people who are funding your ministry. And that's where I am now as I semi-retire is that I can sit with those people and pray with them. They will give one last gift to me, but I don't care anymore. They've become my heart and soul. Sorry, I get quite, you know, because that's where I am right now. It's like, thank you for giving for 41 years of ministry. I mean, how do you add that up? It doesn't matter about the money after five or 10 years. It's the people. And their prayers. Yesterday, one of the staff here, we are coming to you from Transworld Radio Canada, by the way, from their studios. One of the ladies here said that she'd been praying for our son. I know that's why he's still alive today. How can you replace that? She's never been a donor, but, but our donors have also been praying for our family for 40 years. I mean, you can't replace that. How can you say, oh, well, how much did they give you? You know, who cares <laughs> after a while? But at the beginning, you have to care. So first of all, first of all, talk about your ministry. Share your zeal. Don't let that cloud your knowledge. When you are talking to donors, listen to them. Listen to their heart cry. And if your ministry is the same as theirs, God has put you together. Praise God. Say, let's go together. It's not about them giving you money and then you doing what you want. You do have to listen to their advice if it's going to do something against what the Lord has told you to do. Then you say, sorry, we're just not compatible in this. You know, there probably are other ministries where you would be happier giving your money. Don't try and force it. I mean, God never forces us. He puts things in front of us and says, you know, this is the way I'd like you to go. It's up to us to find that and to walk with him tight so that we see. And that's what's really needed when you're raising funds. 
because it's so easy to get distracted. What I also have found is sometimes I've needed money and I thought, okay, I'll get a part-time job. The minute I get a part-time job, guess what? Some funding will come in. So now maybe it is that at that part-time job, I might find donors to my ministry. But it's just so important to respect others more than yourself in the guidance of what God has instructed you to do. So you need to make sure you thank people. Don't take their money and go off. You thank them. You give them regular reports, quarterly, at least, if they don't give a lot. Maybe they only want you to let them know annually. But you need to report back what the Lord has done. And remember Mueller. That's how he raised funds. When you report back to someone and say what you've done with the funds, even if it's going to a conference and you've just started raising them, you can say, okay, I've I've got to 50%. Those donors are going to go out to their friends and find people and help you make it to your goal. That's what happens. If you're trying to do this all by yourself, you know, it's just for you. So remember, this is way bigger. So then you need to thank people, which reminds them of you and reminds them that you're spending their money, you're stewarding their money carefully then you need to ensure that you visit them whenever you can. That's not always possible. Today, you can FaceTime them. I mean, you know, it's it's easy. So have a FaceTime call and find out how their kids are doing. Where are they going to school? What are they studying? If they don't have any children, then what's happening in your life professionally? One time I just asked, how about your staff to a business person? And they went on for an hour. Get into their world. Really get into their world and understand them as people because you're not going to lose anything. (laughs) Even if they don't increase your support, you know what? You've gained huge information from them. You've gained concepts from them. Often they will spiritually feed you when you are calling and talking to them. And that's what you need. You get out to the field, you get out to wherever. You need the spiritual input of your donors. That's why they're on your team. And that's how you think of your team as you're building it. I heard someone describe it once as choosing the wedding party for your wedding. You choose people who are going to love you. And that is a love that does not, you don't lose. You have a responsibility, as I said, to report back, even at the interims, but it's only going to benefit you. You have a responsibility to be accountable. You cannot be offended when people ask you, how did you get that nice camera? (laughs) But you know what? It's okay to have things. We needed that camera for taking photos and we used it a lot. And so we said that and he, he was satisfied. It's fine. But those kind of things are actually kind of rude, but you don't get offended by things like that. You know, don't get offended when people think you should do something different. And you can say, that's a really good suggestion. I'll think about it and pray about it. Let's talk about it in a little while longer or that sort of thing, because you, again, you don't want to change what the Lord's asked you to do. Now, when you are in the middle of raising funds, it's very discouraging. Just remember, this is not an an easy thing to do. And when you have, after you have shared your story, you've shared your zeal, you can really include people. The Lord will bring people into your life that you would never ask. So just get over yourself, take the courage and say, would you be interested in helping me with my ministry, in helping fund my ministry? If they say no, change the topic quick, have something to say (laughs) (laughs) and change the topic really fast because, you know, okay, they're not interested. Fine. Let it go. Uh, You know, the Lord will bring people into your life. But You also have to make the effort. For entrepreneurs in business, they say when they start a business, they ask their friends, family, and fools. (laughs) So first start with your friends and your family. If they're not interested, see who, and that's a little joke I have with the Lord. Okay, so what fool am I supposed to find to help fund this ministry? And God has a sense of humor. What I always like about the Bible is that God's fingerprint is all over it in those places where, oh, well, this person decided to do this. But guess how it was funded? Like Elijah going to a village and walking in the village. And the first person who he sees is a woman gathering sticks. 
And the Lord says to him, ask that woman to look after you. It's like, and she said, well, you know, I'm just gathering these sticks for a fire for my son and my last meal. Well, if she wouldn't have actually done what he asked, she might have died. But because she was part of his team, looking after him, giving him food, that is a picture of what it's like to ask someone for money. Your relationship will flourish. You will share the Lord's bounty. God has chosen you to walk together. Just enjoy the ride. (laughs) So, you know, you're always encouraged to make a list of people you know to specifically ask them. Make sure you do ask someone every day or have a schedule of doing that because you're not going to get anywhere by sitting in a chair and asking the Lord to bring people to your home to talk to you about your ministry. It's not really how it happens. So those are things you need to do. And I think there are other things that are just cultural, and there are some cultures where you you can't be open like that, you can't specifically ask, but there's always some way. There's always some way business people do it. So if you can't find a way, ask your local business person friend. Everybody has a business person friend ask what you should do. There's a really horrible saying in fundraising, and it goes like this. It's very awful. It's, if you want advice, ask for money. If you want money, ask for advice. (laughs) It's not very nice, but it actually is how things work. What I really like about the way that you've just unpacked that is that you've unpacked the heart of fundraising and raising support. Now, I know that there are going to be many people who are listening to this that are planning to come to the Congress now in September to the 4th Luzon Congress in Incheon. And I'm sure that they can take all those principles that you've unpacked for them. What advice would you give to them for sharing the vision? You know, you mentioned that you've benefited from Luzon gatherings. You've probably raised support to attend Luzon gatherings to tell people, hey, I'm going to Korea to go to a conference that's not necessarily an inspiring vision. What would you say for them to say, if you're connecting with someone, this is something that I've done and this is how I painted the picture. You've often mentioned throughout this podcast, this idea of it's not about you as a person, but it's about something greater. So could you just unpack that for us? And then we're going to have to bring this conversation to a close. When you're going to Incheon and you're going on a trip for a conference, it's especially hard right now because people don't go to conferences so much anymore. You don't have to be in person. But for this particular one, you do need to be in person. I guarantee it. So be excited. Be excited about the trip. Yeah, I'm going I'm going to South Korea. I've never been there before either. I'm excited about this trip. Now, why? It's because I know in the hallways, I'm going to meet people who are going to help my ministry grow. I know that in the sessions, I'm going to learn things I have never considered before because they're usually from another cultural perspective. And so in addition to that, I'll be sitting at a table and I'm going to be with people who have been handpicked to be with me to learn about ministry and to share the gospel, how to share the gospel with people. We are all about expanding God's church. What you want to do when you are at any conference, I feel sorry for introverts because I know this is hard, but when you're at a conference, if you do not take advantage of all of the cultures you're going to hear from and how you can apply that in your setting, some you can, some you can, but I guarantee you're going to walk away with the biggest amount of information that you've ever had in any setting. So what you need to convey is that end picture. You're going to learn from others and you're going to apply it in your ministry. First of all, you write down the reason why you're going and what you're going to learn, what you hope to learn, because you've heard from others that that's what happens. Then you contact people by letter, by email, just pick up the phone. Many introverts have problems with this, but you just have to have that zeal, that zeal that I've been talking about. The zeal for this conference seems strange to people because it's just a conference, but these are no just a conference. You have 5,000 people invited from around the world 
to come together and share their ideas. They've all been asked for a reason. Your table that you will sit with at every session, be eight or however many people are at your table, six or eight people, you are going to be sharing your information, your prayer. You're going to have people praying for you who understand you. You're going to be talking about your ministry. You will have time to talk to that table group about your ministry so that there are people who understand what you're going through. They will help you. <laughs> God has put them at the table with you. And then in the hallway, you'll be meeting others because you'll be networking. People at your table will say, oh, you know, you should meet this person or you should meet this person. You'll meet someone from your country who you weren't expecting. Oh, I didn't know someone was going to be here from my country or my town. And you're going to have expressions of God's grace and love and promotion of your ministry to his glory. You're looking for his glory. So that's what you're looking for. And then as you talk to people, why do people go to trade conferences? Why do business people go to trade conferences? It's for the networking. And that's why you're going to this. It's like a trade conference, only it's global. <laughs> unbelievable. It's just unbelievable to have that. And anyway, you need to ask for prayer. Anyone who you know at all, who is of faith in Christ, ask them to pray. And if they are interested in helping you get there, you'll, in asking to pray, they will ask you some questions. And the trajectory in fundraising is, as I said before, it's informing people what you're doing. When someone asks questions, it's a good possibility that the Lord has called them to be on your team. So talk to them about it if they're very interested. Already have in mind how to ask that person if they would want to join the team sending you by funding you. They are either going to or they're not. And so be ready for both of those answers. Awesome. Thank you so much for that. It was rich and enlightening, and I'm sure that it's going to help those who are planning to come to the Congress in September this year, which we are excited about. I mean, it's going to be an electrifying experience. And we're really trusting that God is going to do something amazing out of that experience, that there will be an acceleration of global mission as we come together. Amen. So, it will be. Yeah. Yeah. Barbara, we're going to have to bring this conversation to a close. I feel like we can keep going for much, much longer. Yeah, but unfortunately. For, yeah. <laughs> for our podcast audience, we're going to have to bring it to a close. Maybe we'll bring you back at another point. How can people connect with you? Maybe they've heard some of the things that you've said that they, they want to connect with your ministry. What are some ways they can get in touch? So the best way is by email. So it's barbara at givewayvisioneering.global. It is a global ministry. <laughs> so when you look at the website, Giveway Visioneering, it's not a particularly faith-based website. In fact, it's not at all because I want to really be a minister to anyone and not just those of faith, although that's my specialty. As we bring it to a close, any last thoughts or reflections that you'd like to leave with our audience? You know what? Don't lose your sense of humor. <laughs> uh, I love to see humor in the Bible and don't take yourself seriously. You know, I find in this, it gets so discouraging. It gets so serious. People start taking themselves really seriously. And really, we are just dust and we're all fallible and we can have a good time laughing at ourselves. And that's a Canadian trait which I think everybody could use a little of. <laughs> yeah, but don't take yourself too seriously. Yeah. Wonderful. Barbara, this has been an absolute privilege to hear your stories and your insights today. Your dedication to aligning fundraising with faith and biblical principles and even being willing to do that for those outside of the faith is truly inspiring. So thank you for joining us and for the invaluable work that you're doing with Giveway Visioneering. Thank you, Jason. 